Okay, so guys, so first of all, good afternoon to you all, anybody that is tuning in for this masterclass. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Steve Humpherson, and I am the founder and managing director of Sense, the hospitality agency. Um, big thank you to Simon and Talia and the team at Help Bank for inviting me this afternoon to do this masterclass with you. And the topic I'm going to be talking to you about today is key steps to building a hospitality brand. So a little bit about myself first before we go into this, so it brings some context to, to why I'm talking about this. So personally, I've got over 20 years experience now in the hospitality industry um, and over the years have successfully developed and launched several restaurants, um, bars, luxury hotels right the way across London and Manchester. Um, I suppose most significantly, I had a 10-year tenure with Edwardian Hotels London. Um, and for the last seven years of that tenure, I was the operations and project manager in the service excellence department. So we were responsible for overseeing 13 hotels and 28 restaurants and bars. During that time, obviously, we were very fortunate to create some incredible concepts and brands. Um, and along with that came some significant achievements as well. So just a few of those really were the opening of the London Hotel, which was a, a £650 million hotel development in Leicester Square. Uh, in 2022, that won Hotel of the Year and Best New Build for the Ahead Awards. We also on the rooftop of the London are held uh, the 50 Best Discovery. So if anybody's heard of 50 Best Bars, 50 Best Restaurants, um, we were selected in the 50 Best Discovery category for the Japanese rooftop. Peter Street Kitchen in Manchester, incredible project to work on um, for two years. That won the best British, uh, best luxury British restaurant, should I say, uh, in 2019 and 2022. And then a few significant sort of brand partnerships we worked on during my time there as well with some luxury brands, including Bugatti Cars with Champagne Carbon and then Vogue and Tiffany um, with Edward Enninful. So that kind of gives a bit of a context to who I am and what I've done over, over the last sort of 20 years of my career um, and how I guess uh, eventually I've ended up being in a position to be able to, to do a masterclass such as this. So a little bit about Sense then, which is a company I started last year in 2022, um, Sense the Hospitality Agency. So we are a, uh, a multifaceted agency um, that believe in the power of hospitality, but we have the ability to understand, recognize and value and react to each and every client that we work with as well. Um, Within the sort of remit of, of what we do, we work with all the typical hospitality types of establishments, whether it be restaurants, bars, hotels, members clubs, casinos, private event management. Um, but we also then work with a number of other sectors um, with a view to implementing hospitality type standards into their work environment. So that may be a co-working space, for example, or another great example would be a retail brand or sales showroom. Um, maybe going into a car sales showroom um, to implement sort of luxury service standards into their work environment, or it could be something a little bit more relaxed. It doesn't have to be within the luxury sort of remit. Our expertise within then what we offer, I suppose, really is the operational excellence. Um, we also do menu development, food and, and beverage, especially cocktail development, um, reservations and guest journey, concept development from start to finish. Um, OSNE, which is all of your, say, crockery, cutlery, procurement, and helping sort of bring that brand alive, not just with the, the food, but what it's actually going to be served on itself. All of your brand identity, which we'll kind of touch upon today, ambience curation, project management, and so on. And then just a few examples of sort of clients that we've worked with in the first year. So Labyrinth in Waterloo, uh, Les Ambassadors is a members club in Mayfair. One Access is a luxury concierge company with private jets and, and yacht chartering. Clean Kitchen is at Battersea Power Station. Uh, 18 Sunset Eight in Miami. So a real diverse collection of, of clients that we're obviously very grateful for within our, our first year. And that brings us now then to the sort of main topic of the masterclass. So key steps to building a hospitality brand. Um, one thing I would say is if anybody is listening on this call that isn't necessarily from a hospitality background, there is still a lot of value in this call because a lot of what I'll be discussing with you today is completely transferable regarding it, whether you are launching a hospitality brand or not. It could be in a totally different sector and there will be a lot of resonance between going back to back to your own sort of uh, work environment. 
So what we're doing really is discussing 10 key steps to building a brand. So this is going to cover everything from research and development through to brand mission, competitor analysis, and then into your brand positioning, brand identity, followed by your concept development, customer journey, PR and marketing, training and development, and then finally service excellence. So let's get started with step one, research and development. So research and development really is one of the, the most important processes to get right from day one, because this is going to act as your key stepping stone, um, both when developing your brand mission and also your ethos, which will come at a later stage. And I've broken this down into four key areas. So research trends. What you need to do here is to look at what is hot and what is not right now. Um, I suppose one of the biggest ways of doing this uh, in the market is to look at social media. Um, has something started trending? Um, especially during lockdown, a lot of people started doing things at home and suddenly it became hugely popular. And from that, they've ended up creating restaurant brands. Um, what has been overdone? There's a lot of things in the market which has been completely saturated. Um, and equally, there are a lot of things that maybe haven't been done enough. And if something hasn't been done enough, then this is certainly an opportunity to what I call sweat the asset. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, you've seen a, an opening in the market. Maybe there are people that are doing it. Um, but as the next point you'll see here, what has been done and what has not been done so well, perhaps there are people out there doing what you would potentially like to do. But you've seen an opportunity because they're not executing it as well as they perhaps could do. Um, and actually, you think that you could execute it better. Um, next up, we've got the target audience. So by target audience, this is what demographic um, you're looking to um, target, basically. So where are they based? As an example, you might be doing something that's very much a, a neighborhood hospitality brand, or you may be doing something which is more central to central London, for example. Um, and obviously with that, you will have a key demographic. Are you appealing to um, people maybe that are coming after work? Are you appealing to business lunches? Are you appealing to weekend brunches? That will completely depend on, on what your target audience is going to be. Um, and actually, more often than not, it should really be a, a whole mixture of two or three different uh, demographics. Um, what you certainly don't want to do is to sort of branch yourself out of the market by only targeting one type of demographic, um, because then you, you're never really going to appeal to somebody else. We also need to think about what their interests are, um, and of course, how big is the audience share. And then finally, we go on to be inspired. So who do you admire? Um, there's a lot of restaurants I certainly admire uh, and operators and, and hospitality venues, whether it be a hotel, restaurant, bar, um, gyms even. Um, who do you admire and who do you aspire to be like? Um, this is certainly where you maybe take inspiration from. You might have seen something on your travels. Perhaps you've recently been to, I don't know, say uh, Marrakesh in Morocco. You've been to an incredible restaurant and you'd like to bring a slice of that back to back to the UK or, or wherever that you're looking to create your hospitality, hospitality brand. And then finally, why did it inspire you? So what was it about this brand that you sort of resonated with? Um, what was it that you saw um, something interested um, about, the, about the brand itself? Um, and what makes you want to then bring a slice of that back to wherever it may be? And then the last part on this is being creative. I'm just going to move the screen across to here. So being creative. So this is where you're going to create your mood board. Um, what I would want you to do and suggest that you do it here is to think big. And the reason I say that is that there is no right and there is no wrong, but it's actually much better to think big and scale everything back as opposed to actually thinking very um, small scale uh, and then wishing that you've done it on a much, much bigger scale at a later date. A little bit of a random one, but if your business was a colour, what colour would it be? Uh, you may have noticed already that in this presentation itself, my own brand standards, we've got very monochrome sort of colours, so the greys, the whites and the blacks. That's a colour that represents my brand for, for Sense Hospitality, um, but it could be any colour at all. So what kind of colour would your business be? It doesn't mean the necessary the logo, but if you were to play on emotions and what you want to evoke, um, how do you see that brand being positioned? Next, we go on to step two. So this is your brand mission. So this is where you start to think about who are you? Um, it's an opportunity to uh, solidify the heart and soul of your brand. So your identity, your personality and your voice, uh, maybe what your offering will be. 
Um, why are you doing it? Finding a reasoning for the brand itself. So what is your purpose? What is your why? Uh, and then also, what do you hope to achieve? So setting yourself a goal. So starting with who are we? This is where you start to build it all out now. So what kind of venue do you want to launch? Uh, what type of business do you wish to create? Is it uh, an Airbnb business? Is it a hotel? Is it a brasserie? Is it a bar? Is it the gym? Um, is it a co-working space? Starting to have an idea of the business name. It doesn't need to be a final name, but certainly start to mood board these ideas of, of things that you might have for, for some sort of inspiration. And your identity as well. So how will your customers refer to you? What I mean by that is perhaps you are a restaurant that you want to launch and you've got an idea for name, but what type of restaurant would it be exactly? Do you want to be casual dining? Is it a QSR brand? Is it fine dining? Um, there's a lot of sectors that you can certainly branch down into um, all within the restaurant sector or the hotel sector. You might be luxury five star, you might be small and boutique, for example. Next up, what do we do? Um, so your product, what will you sell and how will you sell it? The structure, how will your offering be structured? So how many menus, for example, might you do? Um, and the scale, how big will your operation be? And then finally, what is the purpose? So money versus purpose. So other than making revenue, and of course, making profit, what else are you looking to champion? Perhaps it's sustainability. Uh, perhaps it's inclusivity. Um, there's a whole host of things now which businesses are looking to do as a, a secondary, if not sort of equal primary purpose for why they want to create this type of hospitality environment. Your passion, why and how are you going to demonstrate your purpose passionately and effectively? And also then your goals. So what are you looking to achieve and in what time frame? Perhaps you want to be, become the most desired Chinese restaurant in Mayfair, as an example, or you want to be the most popular uh, booty B&B in Whitstable in Kent. Um, this is entirely down to you and, uh, and you can start to set these goals for yourself. Step three competitor analysis. So really, really important part of the process here. Um, it's really fundamental because this enables you to define your market position and your target audience. Um, from the brand mission, which we, we've just discussed, this will enable you to kind of define the niche, as I've put here, that the concept will sit in. And when you've discovered your niche, this will allow you to sort of then establish who the competitors are within that niche. So who are the competitors? Um, what do they do, for example? Um, there's a number of questions that we could be asking here. So what is their brand identity even? What is their own brand mission? Um, what do their reviews say? Perhaps you start to look at the guest sentiments about what they do and what they don't do well. Um, what's their own tone of voice? And where are they? So where are they located? Are they close proximity to where you are? Are they further afield? But perhaps actually it's exactly the same type of concept of, of which you're looking to create. Um, when did they open is a, is a great one to look at. So are they a new brand themselves or perhaps they've been there for five years, 10 years, 15 years? They could be a startup type business or they could be sort of well established and well on the way with having multiple outlets. Um, why are they a competitor? So what is it about them that makes them a competitor? Again, is it their location? Is it the type of food or drink that they're offering? Is it the type of hotel that it might be? If it's a gym, perhaps, um, do they offer the same type of classes? Um, and how are you going to compete against them? Um, how will you do things differently? Um, how much do they charge is also a great example. It's not just also of looking at the concept itself, but breaking all of these different things down to looking, okay, they offer the same type of food, they're in a similar location, but actually what are they charging for a beer? What are they charging for a cocktail? What are they charging for a, uh, a month's gym membership? Or what are they charging for a one night stay? All these kind of things, you'll start to fully build out your concept analysis. Step four is your brand positioning. So again, really important aspect to look at. And this is how your hospitality brand will position itself in the landscape. Um, it is a very difficult industry to get into. It's very competitive. Um, and so obviously establishing the brand positioning is key um, when you're looking to attract your potential customers. And what I've done here is I've used an example actually of one of our former clients. So this is Clean Kitchen Club. Um, we help them to launch a number of sites across London and their main flagship is in the new Battersea power station development. Um, without sort of having to delve into it too much, they're very, very um, focused on putting the messaging out that you see here. So they are 100% plant-based, so you don't have to be. Making plant 
based mainstream. So this is, does exactly what it says on the tin. Their main brand um, position in it is that they are 100% plant-based. It's a vegan-based brand, but actually you don't have to be 100% vegan to go and enjoy their food. Perhaps this is appealing to somebody that might go once a month or once every week. They want to have a fairly health, healthy um, day or they want to start giving something back and start to be sustainable in their own lifestyle. Um, and this is the messaging that they go on. Uh, and in doing so, that, that's enabling them to make plant based mainstream because vegan food and plant based is no longer um, thought of as, you know, casting off people that eat those kind of diets. It's very, very much at the foreground of a lot of restaurants and, and operators minds now. Um, and, in, you know, we're increasingly seeing not just fully plant based brands um, opening, but also a lot of non plant based brands. Um, increasing the amount of plant-based options on their menus. Step five, brand identity. So the key objective of this part of, of, of the journey really is to create a brand identity that will resonate with your customers. Um, this in turn is what customers will connect with the most. Um, and of course, what's going to help create the brand loyalty as well. So you've got four sections here that I tend to recommend that you need to look at. First of all is your name. Um, this is really going to be the first impression of your brand. Um, and it's often going to be heard before it's seen. Next will be your logo. Um, this will help cement the brand identity. But there must be some sort of synergy with the name. There's no point having a name that where your logo just does not have some kind of relationship um, at all. Then some kind of tagline. This is optional, but it's often successful. Um, a couple of examples that I know you will know of is KFC. Everybody thinks of finger licking good. Um, and McDonald's, everybody thinks of I'm loving it. There's no right or wrong here. You don't have to have one, um, but it's something that people will associate with if they hear it. If you hear finger licking good, automatically you think of KFC. And then finally, the tone of voice. So what is your brand personality? Um, this is often most relevant, as I've put here, on social media platforms. And to give this kind of context, linking it back now to my own business, you'll see here we have the name, sense, we have the tagline, the hospitality agency, and then we go into our tone of voice. So sense are passionate about engaging with innovative brands clients and entrepreneurs to turn your vision into a reality, harnessing anything you can see, smell, hear, taste and touch. Playing on that whole journey from the senses, anything, maybe you go into a hotel, everybody likes to feel the texture of the cushions and the pillows. Everybody loves it when you walk into a restaurant and there's a beautiful smell in the toilets or coming from the kitchen. You love to hear the DJ playing in the corner. All of the senses that we sort of associate but don't always think about when we go into a hospitality environment, um, this is what we sort of champion within Sense, our agency. <laughs> Excuse me. Concept six. Yeah, it's, sorry, steps is, this is the concept development stage. So this is where things start to get really exciting. Um, however, as I put here, this is the phase where it's often mistaken for purely creating your menu or your brand. Um, but there's actually much more to it than creating what you're going to serve or sell. So as you'll see here, I've broken it down into some key areas. And obviously this is focused on a restaurant from this perspective, um, but this will start to get your head thinking about the, the things that you might not necessarily think of. So yes, there is an element of looking at your menu, but within that, what does that include? So you may have an a la carte menu, separate beverage menus. You may do a brunch or a Sunday roast at the weekend a breakfast, an afternoon tea, private dining, and set menus. There's a whole host of things that you might need to consider within that menu development. And of course, when you get to that point, you then need to do all the pricing as well. Um, how are you going to be competitive? Where are you going to pitch yourself from a pricing point of view? Design is also key. That is certainly part of your concept. There's no point having a, a concept of the type of food that you're going to have, but walking in and the aesthetics of the restaurant or the hotel just to totally don't fit what you're looking to achieve. So your floor plans, your kitchen, your front of house, your back of house, how is that concept sort of um, displayed through the whole experience, whether I walk into the hostess desk or to the hotel or to the gym, um, the interiors, the textures, the key features. This is what we call the FF and E, fixtures, fittings, and equipment. And then you go into your hardware. So, what uniform will you stack where? Um, what menu hardware itself would they have? So, once you've developed your menu, would you have your logo sitting on the front of a beautiful menu folder? 
Do you have branded coasters? Um, do you have branded cloakroom pegs, for example? Another great one, perhaps you're a hotel, do you have branded umbrellas? This is all part of that journey um, of touch points of where your concepts can come to life. And then finally, your ambience. This is something which we're really keen on um, working with our, our clients at Sense. So everything from the lighting and the sound, uh, the entertainment, the scent integration and the soft decor. So a great example of this might be, say, your restaurant might open for dinner service at 5 p.m. Um, and it closes then at midnight, but your lighting, as your lighting during the evening comes down, perhaps as it comes down, the sound of the music goes up. So it starts to create that more uh, ambient sort of vibe in your establishment. And this really is just a bit of a mood board of how that could look. Um, so you've got, as I say, you've got your menu, you've got your crockery, your cutlery. What are your drinks going to be served in? How do the floor plans look? Have you got a live DJ? Have you got a live band? Step seven is your customer journey. And this requires some serious thought. So it's where you take your new concept and, and start to map out the entire customer journey from start to finish. So first of all, obviously, you need to attract these people uh, and they need to make a reservation, a booking. Once you've got them, how are you going to then engage with them pre-arrival? So perhaps I make a hotel booking for next week. What communications are you going to send out between now and then? Would I get an email to say, Mr. Humperson, we're really looking forward to seeing you next week. Perhaps we'd like to put, um, would you like us to put a glass of, or bottle of champagne in the room for arrival? Could we make any restaurant reservations for you? All of those touch points that's going to completely weigh the guest. How are you then welcoming the guests when they come into your establishment? What kind of experience are they having? How are you bidding them farewell? The welcome is equally as important as the farewell because the farewell is the parting bit that they will remember the most. And of course, how are you then going to follow up people? Perhaps they're going to leave you a review. We always tell our clients that they must respond to all reviews, regardless of if they're positive or negative. That will be what drives people to read book. And in return, that's what's going to give you guest retention. Here's just a couple of those questions that we've already just mentioned. So how will you acquire the reservations? What kind of platforms would you be on? What com uh, communications will guests receive before the visit? How will they be greeted when they come to your establishment? What's the sequence of the service? How will we create a memorable experience? How do we respond to guest reviews? Um, and perhaps what loyalty rewards may we offer as well to our guests? Step eight, PR and marketing. Now, in this section, there's several key marketing strategies, um, but really what you need to do is have a complete sort of um, relationship between all five of these, because when they collaborate with each other, um, that's what's going to create a well-positioned um, and admired brand presence in the market. So first of all, your direct marketing. So this might be anything, um, you might be a more relaxed brand, you may do some sort of branded flyers or collateral that you hand out, um, anything on POS within your actual establishment. Then we move to digital. So this could be anything with your SEO or your PPC, um, driving bookings with your keywords and so on and paid adverts. Then you go into branded mail out. So obviously everybody's going to start to build out a database. So you may send out newsletters. Um, it may have information of offers or events. Social media is obviously key. Um, as I've put here, this is the shop window really of marketing and probably the most powerful tool right now. Um, so your content creation is key to make sure that A, it's consistent, that you're doing it frequently, uh, but also that the messaging going out is, you know, representative of your brand. And then finally, influencer marketing. Um, so the perception of this will give you extra credibility. Um, and this effectively allows you to double down on your brand reach. You will have your own brand reach for your um, hospitality brand, but perhaps I start to get some key food influencers or travel influencers or fitness influencers in um, to the establishment, and then it will appear to their half a million followers, 20,000 followers, 2 million followers, um, and it's leveraging their network to sort of draw more people to your brand as well. Step nine, training and development. And this is one of my passions, I suppose, really, um, because it's all very well having an amazing brand, but you also then need the team to bring it all together. Um, and they also then need to deliver consistent, consistently um, to ensure that your, your product 
um, is not only uh, sort of profitable, um, but also that the guest experience that you're delivering is world class, um, that your employee satisfaction is extremely high, uh, and that you have great brand loyalty as well. Sometimes the most ordinary things can be made extraordinary simply by doing them with the right people. This is a quote that I absolutely love and something that I always try and get my clients to um, engage with because it really is about doing it with the right people. If you can get the right people into your brand and people that believe in your brand, um, effectively people that will become brand ambassadors, um, then half of your job as the brand owner is done um, because they will live and breathe everything about what you've created um, and nobody speaks more and markets your restaurants more or the hotels more than, than your actual employees. So what we tend to work with here is uh, focusing on sort of service steps, so the walk. Um, this is how you hold yourself. What is your posture? Um, how confident you are? How do you command the floor? Um, perhaps, you know, you walk into a, a restaurant or hotel. Everybody always knows who the restaurant manager is or the hotel manager or the gym manager. Um, they've got a certain um, aura around them. So how, how do you command that space? The talk. So what is this? The greetings. How do you engage with your guests? You're going to engage with the guests very differently in a five-star environment as you are in a, a, a small sort of a coffee shop establishment, for example. You know, you may go into a five-star hotel and, and be greeted and say, you know, good evening, Mr. Humpherson, allow me to take your bags for you to your suite. Whereas you may walk into a black sheep coffee or Monmouth coffee shop and you may get more of a, hi guys, what can I get for you? Um, again, there's no right or wrong, but what is the right talk for your establishment? The look is also really important. We've spoken about the uniform, the grooming standards. This is really important because it, it represents your brand. Um, 10 years ago, when I first went into the, well, in fact, 12 years ago, now into the corporate world, tattoos weren't allowed to be on the show, for example. And now, yeah, I've got a, a full sleeve and the same, the same company are now embracing um, and actively allowing people to, to have their tattoos on show. So inclusivity is really, really important in, um, in a modern day operation. The finesse, so this is the standards of service, what I call the 24 hour clock, constantly being alert to everything. Um, maybe there's an empty cup over there, there's a napkin on the floor, there's a light switch um, socket turned on down there, there's a light bulb up there that's blown, there's a broken glass on the floor over here. You must have that whole 360 degree view of your surrounding. And when you do do that, then you'll be able to deliver the standards consistently um, and you'll be able to do it as per what you set from the day one of what your vision, uh, what you wanted that brand to be. And when you have all of those in one go, that's where the show comes. It's like a theater, it's, it's a performance. So in doing so, you need to educate then your team, set them up to win, always provide them with the tools, give them everything that they need, whether it be equipment, giving it further training, um, brand partnerships even is a great one. Um, get LVMH in to come and do a champagne training on Dom Perignon, or perhaps you go to William Grant and ask the Sipsmith Gin um, brand manager to come in and, and train all your staff on the gin tastings. This will really engage your team. Communicate with them often. Um, encourage feedback and, and always have an open door policy to share your knowledge. This will make them feel like they're being mentored uh, and give them something to work towards. And in return, then this will motivate them. Um, it'll create a great culture. Um, it will always inspire them, uh, but make sure that you always reward success as well. And I suppose from here, where this then uh, develops into is a whole cycle, um, which goes round and round and round the further training that you give within your brand. So by giving your team the right training, that's going to give them the best product knowledge that they can have. They'll know your product inside out and be able to sell it to anybody and everyone. Once they're able to have that and hold that knowledge, they're able to anticipate the guest's needs, regardless of what the establishment is. Um, and by anticipating the guest's needs, that just gives your entire team the best confidence they can have in their role. They walk in every single day knowing that they're set up and they can act on that floor or wherever they may be and perform their very best. When they do so, that's when they'll be delivering exemplary service standards. And obviously, as a result of that, you'll have 100% or hopefully have 100% guest satisfaction. Um, you could also argue, and it most certainly should be the case, that you'll also have 100% employee satisfaction as well. And when you do, that's what will build your brand power. 
And of course, as soon as you've got a powerful brand, that really is going to drive new business, um, but it's also going to increase the retention of existing customers as well. So you'll be attracting new clients, but you'll also be holding on to existing clients as well. And that's really what's going to give you the most revenue and the profit. And then finally, step 10 is the service excellence itself. So we are what we, we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. A beautiful quote from Aristotle. So again, this is absolutely living and breathing what you do. Um, it's not an act, it's a habit. The more you do it, the more you become accustomed to it, you completely forget, and it's just part of your everyday DNA. And once you reach this stage, really, step 10, um, from the day the concept was conceived to the long-term goal of the brand, as I put here, the success and the longevity of the brand relies heavily upon you as the owner um, to ensure the consistency and the same level of excellence every single time. And finally, just to, I suppose, wrap this up is what I like to call the hospitality triangle. So I'm sure you've all heard of the uh, fire triangle between uh, oxygen, heat, uh, and fuel. If you remove any of those three sources, you will not have fire. And much in the way that I like to sort of uh, replicate it to here, if you remove the product, which could be the food, the beverage, the room, if you remove the level of service from arrival or departure, or if you remove uh, an element of the ambience, lighting, music, scent integration, temperature, maybe it's too cold or too hot, then that will be what your guests will walk away remembering as part of your brand. So you must have all three of these perfected and absolutely nailed down in order to give the best brand perception that you possibly can. And I suppose then just finally is the next steps just to wrap it up. Um, so we've gone through now the, the what I like to call the first 10 steps. And then the next step really is just giving it time um, just being patient. A lot of people will rush into creating a brand. And if it's not necessarily successful overnight, Rome wasn't built overnight, as we all know, um, then they sort of try and, and think about giving it in at the first hurdle. But you really must stick with it um, and have a lot of patience with it. And, and also remaining agile. There's having patience, but also being able to be adaptable if you need to be once your brand is successful. Um, COVID-19 is a great example. So many uh, operators had to be reactive as opposed to proactive because there was no choice. You know, a, a new legislation would come out from the government and within an hour, everything had to be acted upon and, and implemented. So just remaining agile to, to whatever you may need to respond to. Uh, and finally, just having belief in your brand. You know, you've created this brand from start to finish um, and both you and your team must absolutely live and breathe it because if you don't believe in the brand yourself, then you're going to really struggle to get somebody else to believe in your brand um, as well. And that really finally um, just wraps everything up from me. So I am going to, first of all, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, but more importantly, I'm just going to have a look now at the webinar chat and see if anybody has got any questions they would like to ask me before we close off, off this chat. I can see that somebody's asked if there's a recorded version. Um, yes, this is going to be recorded. Um, as Help Bank have put here, this will be uploaded to uh, YouTube. So if anybody wants to have a hard copy of this, then you'll be able to see it there as well. Any further questions? Hi, Karishma. Um, tips on researching the local food preferences and tailoring recipes according to it. Um, I would say one of the first things to do really is if you're looking at a local area, um, one of the first things to do, whether people use it or not, is always to look at uh, review sites. So uh, Google reviews, uh, TripAdvisor, um, perhaps it's open table reviews or seven, seven rooms reviews, any of the booking channels. This will not only allow you to um, find out the types of restaurant or bar or whatever it might be that are in the area that you're looking at, uh, but it will also show you what perhaps guests have commented on. Maybe somebody said, I really enjoyed the lamb carpaccio. So maybe somebody had a, a, a not so great experience and, and said that the burger was served cold or minus fillings and so on. Um, so that will completely allow you to sort of embrace who is in the local area uh, and also see what is hot or not, like I mentioned it before. 
And from there, that would then allow you to tailor your recipes accordingly. If you see that there's a certain area where, um, let's pick vegan food, for example, or plant-based, that it might predominantly be quite popular, or actually you're in an area where there's a lot of grab-and-go foods, people just want to get a quick bite to eat for lunch in a very business-orientated area, um, you want to be looking at those types of recipes that will tailor to those guests. Let's have a look here. So who else do we have? Um, Jamie, let's, what have we got here? Advice for someone with a strong brand idea and where, how it should be, but without the budget to do it by themselves. Best funding options. To be honest, Jamie, right now, um, there are so many resources out there that depends when, when you say creating the brand idea. Um, there's a lot that you can do completely for free on um, online platforms or at a, a very reduced cost. Um, you don't necessarily have to get sort of um, funding in place to have the foundations. Um, there are channels that you can use such as Canva, which is a great uh, designer, uh, which people can create presentations on. You can do pitch decks on there. Um, it's very, very flexible in terms of what you can create. You can do a logo, um, anything that you might need to effectively have something on paper to present your brand. Um, and I guess once you've got that in place, if you did then need to get any sort of funding, um, it's better to have something to show somebody so that you can convey your uh, your vision uh, and what your concept is, as opposed to just going to somebody that asking for investment, but you've, you've not physically got anything to show them. Um, Veronica, I can see there you said about software to support the processes. And again, Canva is, is a great tool for that. Um, I highly recommend having a look at that, that system. SW, do you teach courses? Um, this is actually the first masterclass that I've, I've done since launching Sense. Um, but I do do a lot of training and development with our clients. Um, if we have a new brand that's opening, um, I'll actively be within their team creating the service standards itself. Um, so I suppose from a teaching perspective, there's a lot that I do do, um, but I'd certainly be keen and obviously thanks to Help Bank for asking me and inviting me to be part of this, this course today. Um, if that's something that you'd be interested in doing, um, it is something that I'm considering doing more often. Um, and so by all means, if you'd like to drop me a message, um, Help Bank have put a link just there to my LinkedIn page and to my website. So if you'd like to reach out, um, it's certainly something we could discuss in more detail. Hi, Jamie. Another, once we have the concept nailed down, what's the best way to engage Sense formally in a consultative capacity? <laughs> Please do get in touch. We'd love to get involved with, with any projects that people uh, may have, regardless of how big or how small. Um, as I say, um, the Help Bank team have shared the details there. So the LinkedIn is to my, my personal page. You've also got the Sense website there. Um, you'd be able to submit a contact um, request via the website, or you can send me a DM on, on LinkedIn, um, or just the info at sense.agency will also come through to me as well. Um, failing that, we're also on, on Instagram, so you can also send me DMs there on Steve Humpherson or on the Sense page as well. Um, I'd love to hear more about what you have in mind, Jamie, um, and we can sort of certainly be part of that process, um, regardless of how soon or how late in the process it, it may be for you. I did see one more question I think that I missed. Was there Annie Vega? Hi, Annie. Sorry I missed you earlier. Uh, what is a common mistake uh, we can try to avoid when developing a new brand? Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes is not doing actually a lot of the, the things um, from the get-go that I mentioned is make sure you do your research. Um, the, a lot of people do what I call a passion project. Um, maybe they go away on a holiday or they've been uh, to a different city and suddenly they've been somewhere and suddenly they're inspired and say, I want to do this and I'm going to open it. I'm going to do it next week. Um, more often you find that, that the people that do do that kind of approach are the ones where they'll open a venue um, and within three to six months, unfortunately, it's closed down because they haven't done um, all the, the process from start to finish. So um, the biggest advice I can get really to avoid making mistakes is to from 
start to finish, do your research, really hone in on what you think you want to create. Make sure that it's not been overdone, but also um, is it something that's underdone, as I, as I mentioned right at the beginning. And, and making sure, as again, that everything that you do create is, is believing in, in that brand that you are doing. Um, I've met a number of people in the past where they, 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 I suppose I call it talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They're, they're very good salespeople. Um, but actually on, on paper, it sounds great. But when you deep dive into it, the financials, the, the actual concept plan, um, there's unfortunately no legs into it. So um, I hope that helps. Um, and then we have another question, Karishma again. Tips on having affordable food while also aiming to give beautiful experience to the customers, including quality food, decor, and added memorable experience. Great question right now, Karishma. And actually one of the biggest problems that operators are having, um, much like everything else is, you know, um, utility bills, are not just residentially, but commercially are going up. So the cost of actually being able to cook and wash and, 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 and everything you want, prepare your food uh, has gone up. Um, but equally, especially with things like Brexit, um, lack of uh, manpower in farms and so on, the cost of produce has gone up drastically. Um, so it is obviously something that you need to consider um, when you're doing your business plan. Um, but what I would say is to, in order to be a, a, as affordable as possible is, uh, again, I see this very often, is a lot of brands will have far too many things on their menu. They might have 20, 30, 40 different dishes. It's much better to maybe have 10 and deliver them well and be profitable than to have a huge menu, offer too much, and actually your food wastage is through the roof. And of course, then that's just going to affect your bottom line. By doing that, by having a, 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 not a reduced, but a, you know, a, a focused, uh, minimalized menu, that in turn will enable you to create those beautiful experiences because you'll be able to spend time um, creating them you know, spend more time on each dish, as it were, um, as opposed to having far too many and not being able to execute it in a beautiful manner. That also goes for cocktails, exactly the same as well. Um, a lot of prep nowadays goes into uh, making cocktails. It's not just about throwing a few ingredients into a mixer. Um, there is sometimes more prep in a cocktail now than there is um, in food. Um, and especially with mixologists, they're working in kitchens um, with chefs to create part of those ingredients. So again, making sure that you, you've got beautiful ingredients, but that you're not using things that are too expensive and, and it's gonna really cost your bottom line. I think really, I don't see any more questions. So um, I guess, first of all, I would like to thank you all for the questions for anybody that has asked one. Um, if anybody else is on the call that has not had an opportunity to ask one or would uh, perhaps maybe thinks of something at a later date. As I mentioned, all the details are there where you can get in touch with me personally. I'm more than happy to answer any further questions that you've got. Um, thank you for attending again. And uh, thank you also to, to Simon and to Talia at Health Bank for, for helping to organise this masterclass. So thank you all again. Hope you have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week. Cheers, guys.